So our first speaker is Dr. Megan Davis from Johns Hopkins University. And Dr. Davis has been part of our organizing committee. And it's been a pleasure working with you on this. And we appreciate your contribution to the workshop. So thank you. Thank you, Margaret, and thanks to everyone uh, for this. I think the workshop identifies some incredibly important topics. So let's see if I can get my AV working. Great. OK, so I am going to tell a little bit of a, a story as I go. I'm going to um, drill in on one key example, but use it as a way to think about some of the larger issues that we struggle with. And as Margaret said, we've got kind of duets here of immunologists and either toxicologists or epidemiologists. And I would fall into maybe the epidemiologists and microbiologists side of things. And you might say that microbiologists try not to have favorites, but I do have a favorite bacterium. And this is Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram-positive colonizing opportunistic pathogen. So what I want to do is, under the motivation of how infectious diseases and environmental stressors interact, I want to give this case example with a couple of different variations on this theme. And I'm doing all of this within a One Health framework, as Laura so beautifully set up for us this morning. I, um, I have to admit, I, I teach a very large course in environmental health. And so I pulled a couple slides from this course because I think it's important to come back to this foundation as our motivation. So when we think about the environmental health paradigm that we've already seen today, we know that exposure, maybe we think about to chemical toxicants, will lead to clinical disease through a pathophysiologic mechanism. And if we want to dive into what this mechanism is, we might call that toxicology. If we are instead looking at exposure as infectious disease agent, we might think about this pathophysiology instead as immunology or infectious disease dynamics within the individual host. But of course, as an epidemiologist, we're sometimes a little bit reductionist, and we come back to the E to O paradigm. How does exposure relate to your clinical disease O outcome? And a number of years ago, a group of us under Dr. Ellen Silbergeld, whose name you've heard previously and whose name you likely will hear again, um, worked on imagining how infectious diseases fit into this toxicological paradigm. And this work was led by Dr. Beth Feingold at UAlbany, who is, I believe, joining us on the webinar. So a shout out to Beth. So we thought a lot, and maybe, maybe this will work. Hey, it does. So we thought a lot about kind of where things come from, what our sources are. You might think of this, you know, the smokestack with a chemical. And with infectious disease agents, you might think about a reservoir. We're going to come back to reservoirs in a minute. And these move through the environmental media, and then they cause disease through this toxicological mechanism. Infectious diseases may have a parallel pathway, but we also imagined that in the way we develop our studies, we might need to think about the synergy, the effect modification that infectious disease agents might have with chemical toxicants on a shared disease outcome. So let me give you one example as I've imagined it. Here we have the question of pathogens in an environmental context. And so we might have animals. We've heard about the food chain several times today. So you might think about maybe a campylobacter, and it's spread through a piece of retail meat. And that pathogen is, exposes some person. There's an infectious dose. The cells get infected, and the person progresses to a campylobacter infection. But of course, we can also imagine the potential for a feedback loop. We might already have chemicals present in the environment that could change the virulent structure of these pathogens. And indeed, the disease itself, the infection, might create this loop where with greater virulence or antimicrobial resistance within pathogens, we move to more or different antimicrobial drugs, which then exert selective pressure on that same pathogen population. And this, of course, might have some potential for co-selection and for differential effects in terms of the immune response. 
So when I look at Staph aureus, I really consider this, again, from a One Health perspective. I think about it in humans. I think about it in animals who may or may not do as well at carrying Staphylococcus aureus. And I think a lot about it in the environment. And so what we found in our work and the work of others is that it is, um, it's pretty good at hanging out in the environment. I dare say if I brought a sterile Swiffer into this room and swabbed some surfaces, I could come back with some Staph aureus for you. Maybe, maybe some MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is, of course, the poster child for our antimicrobial-resistant forms of Staph aureus. We know that homes can be contaminated up to rates of 100%. And we found both Staph aureus in its methicillin susceptible and resistant forms on multiple household surfaces, just a few depicted here in this graphic. And the way I think about it is really in terms of exposure as it relates to colonization and then ultimately infection in people. But in homes, it's not like Staph aureus spring full formed into the environment, you know, like Athena from the head of Zeus. Staph aureus often comes from a host, and in this case, most typically the human host. We know Staph aureus in companion animals tends to be the same strains that are circulating in the human population suggesting that they derive their Staph aureus from their human owners. So here we have our, our hapless person who has Staph aureus colonization and sheds this into the environment, where the environment then may serve as a reservoir for recolonization or colonization of a new host that comes into this particular environment. So we looked at homes of people who had been recently diagnosed with a MRSA skin or soft tissue infection, and we found, depending on the surface, and these are just different surfaces, this, by the way, um, the leading candidate is the bedroom pillow of the person with MRSA, and yes, we did ask about recent laundering, and no, it didn't help. So here we have contamination rates of um, upwards of 70% at that one particular site and then varying ranges over site and time. But then we wondered, well, why would we worry about MRSA in the home environment, A, because it can be a reservoir for recolonization, but B, because we use a lot of chemicals in our environment. And so we wondered what risk factors there might be to drive multidrug resistance within these strains that were already MRSA. So we're looking at MRSA plus three additional classes of antimicrobial resistance. And unsurprisingly, we found that either human or animal use of antimicrobial drugs was associated with it. That makes sense. That's selective pressure. But we also found that in the small number of homes that did not use disinfectants that were classified by the EPA as MRSA sidle, that is that they killed MRSA, we found lower rates of multidrug resistance in those MRSA isolates. So there's this potential for disinfectants to maybe co-select for antimicrobial resistance. And we also found, kind of related to what we've heard earlier about the uses in livestock and rural areas, that rural residence was a complete risk factor at baseline for multidrug resistant MRSA. We had no rural homes that were not. Now, it's a small study. So, but this begs the question, what are these environmental chemicals that can be associated with resistance in this very important human pathogen? We have another example, and this comes from Dr. Lance Price and his colleagues who used genetic testing of Staph aureus strains of a very emergent clone that was just termed CC398, clonal complex 398 on the basis of strain typing. And based on their whole genome sequencing, they found an interesting story. This is a Staph aureus that emerged in Europe as a MRSA, and it was associated with people who had contact with livestock. And so they asked the question, but where did it come from? And so they obtained all the isolates they could over time from uh, global sources, and they identified that the, the first time they found it was as a susceptible strain. It was still Staph aureus, but it did not carry the MEK-A gene conferring methicillin resistance, and it was in humans. And then when they saw it in livestock, it emerged, but it emerged not just with that MEK-A gene for methicillin resistance, it also carried in close location to that gene, a gene for tetracycline resistance. Now, 
I'm a former dairy veterinarian, and what I can tell you is that we have used antimicrobial drugs in livestock for a very long time. Sometimes we use it as growth promotion, sometimes we use it for disease prevention, and sometimes for treatment. But tetracycline is one of the favorite drugs, and certainly was documented to have been used on farms in Europe around the same time. And this, of course, begs the, the, the potential for putative selection pressure, not from uses of penicillin, but from uses of tetracycline to drive methicillin resistance. And other researchers later added zinc to this list. Now, you might ask, well, why zinc? Well, zinc is an important micronutrient, and you need certain quantities of zinc to survive. And so veterinary nutritionists have been using zinc supplementation for a long time. And zinc supplementation is something that's added to the feed. So they found an association between a zinc resistance gene and this particular strain of MRSA. So I think this is just food for thought. It, it helps us understand that some of the dynamics that we see between the chemicals and the infectious agents might not occur within a human host. They may occur within an animal host or within the environment. Staph aureus also has been associated in human hosts with lead biomarkers. So another research group took a look at NHANES, which is, we were talking about surveillance data sets earlier, so it's a large nationally representative surveillance data set of people in the United States. It's population weighted. And therefore, we can use it to help generalize to the entire U.S. population. And they found that these biomarkers of blood lead were associated with greater detection of MRSA and lower detection of MISA. So more of the resistant form and less of the susceptible form. And they postulated these three scenarios. I think they're important to consider because they help us understand maybe the timeline and the causal framework in which we consider these questions. So in scenario one, they said, well, maybe the person was exposed at some point, maybe in childhood, and that prior lead exposure means that they have some lead in the body, whether it's circulating as the blood lead levels or it's, you know, in bone, in various other reservoirs in the body. And this may prevent colonization by susceptible strains. Scenario two is the person was colonized and then exposed to lead and that's selected for the MRSA. Or scenario three, which I think is important for us to consider, is that maybe the lead was in the home. The lead was in the environment. The lead was in the water that was coming into the house. The lead was therefore impacting Staph aureus that can be part of a biofilm in a water system. So to bring in that little engineering control component and think about, well, maybe these MRSA are selected in the environment and then the person is exposed through that route that we thought about earlier from the home environment. So that led me to think about whether other environmental chemicals, ones that we might want to consider intervening upon, could be associated with the same kinds of outcomes. And so I looked at whether there was any relationship between phthalate exposures and Staph aureus in NHANES. And this is work that we have not yet published, but we're in preparation to submit. What we found is that the phthalates, and these are plasticizers, they're found often in like PVC pipes, they can be found in cosmetics, you can even find them in those time-release capsules used in pharmaceutical drugs. So if you have one of those extended-release capsules, they can contain phthalates. And we found that the high molecular weight phthalates and about half of the low molecular weight phthalates, which are not pictured here, were associated with increased odds of Staph aureus colonization. And we were measuring the phthalates in NHANES, it's in the, the urine. So these are urinary biomarkers. And there was certainly a trend effect from quartile one, which is the lowest concentration of each of these metabolites, to the highest quartile or highest concentration. So let's come back to what other things staph can do and why else I might be worried about staph aureus in the environment. It's not just because it's associated with these infection outcomes, but because we've been worrying about it also as a driver of inflammatory, what we might term or not term, non-communicable disease. So I study inner city kids with asthma. 
So these are kids who already have asthma and we're looking for exacerbation, why they might have worse disease than someone who is otherwise better controlled. And is there an environmental driver of that? By the way, we know that phthalates are associated with worse respiratory disease in these kids. So I think a lot about the non-infectious roles of bacteria. And certainly we know that they can elicit inane, I'm sorry, innate <laughs> immune responses, certainly not inane. And that means that they're going to drive these um, pieces of the immune system that are just part of who we are. And we know that other bacterial products can do this. Endotoxin is the lipopolysaccharide coat of gram-negative bacteria. We um, referred to this earlier in Laura Kahn's talk. Um, that can really cause a pyrogenic response or a fever response, and you can have a lot of inflammation. My, uh, my favorite bacterium staph produces enterotoxin proteins. So not every strain will. Some strains will carry the genes that let them do this, and some strains won't. But these enterotoxin proteins are, are basically super antigens. They cause a nonspecific uh, T cell activation and cytokine release upon exposure, and therefore they can really drive a lot of these inflammatory processes. So in this case, we might think about whether we have a toxicant exposure and a pathogen exposure that can operate along the same same inflammatory pathways and therefore both cause the same disease. And this would be kind of modeled this way. So any exposure, a first exposure would be expected to produce this. So this would be an acute disease in that acute to chronic kind of range that we've been discussing or that paradigm. But I also think about it in terms of allergy because proteins, of course, can create the potential for sensitization. You know, we think about peanut allergy, we think about cockroach allergy, we think about mouse allergy. All of these are to different protein epitopes. And this is a Th2 bias response that typically requires some sort of prior exposure. And so I tend to think about this more in terms of effect modification, that if you are sensitized and exposed, then you will be more likely to progress to disease. And this will be different than if you are not sensitized, where exposure may or may not progress to disease or not progress at the same slope for the biostatisticians in the audience. And so we might think about this instead as the first exposure should elicit no response because that's when the first exposure might create the potential for sensitization. But later exposures could lead to exacerbation because someone already now has developed the immune response that will bias them to a Th2 or allergic immune response. So we've looked at this with Staph aureus, and I'm coming back to that favorite surveillance data set of mine. I have a lot of favorites, it turns out. And so we evaluated in, in the few years where we had Staph aureus colonization data, the um, associations between Staph aureus nasal colonization and respiratory outcomes. And we identified that if you looked at the whole population, it was like ho-hum, maybe some associations with emergency room visits for wheeze, but we're not going to get too worried about it. But when I focused in on my targets, my kids, I found that there was actually quite a bit of potential for a problem here. So I found increased odds of multiple respiratory outcomes among those who were between the ages of 6 and 30. And for those of you who don't study asthma, a, it's hard to diagnose before age five, which is why we start at six. And B, kids often have allergic asthma, and adults, it's a lot different. And so you'll see that some children will resolve, and then they'll be fine as adults. So we may have very different host mechanisms operating here. And so this is also my reminder to say the importance of host processes cannot be understated. And here we have the potential for effect modification as illustrated by the significant interaction p-values in the right-hand column. So this was interesting, but I was curious if it was colonization or if it was exposure to maybe these staph and teratoxin proteins in the dust that could be the mechanism for this kind of association. So we used biospecimens and data from a multicenter randomized trial that was completed as part of the inner city asthma, asthma consortium, and this was the ACE trial. And these were inner city kids with asthma, 
And we were able to find um, these Staphantera toxins, which are helpfully named A, B, C, D. A through C tend to be the most common, and SEA was our winner. We had about 62% detection rate in the home dust extracts. And we found that all of the SEs were associated with reduced activity, and then there were kind of sporadic associations in the entire cohort. But when we stratified by history of eczema, we found that it was different that those kids who really had no history of eczema, which might be a proxy for um, allergic disease processes, had higher odds. And so we're still trying to identify why it wasn't those with eczema who would typically have been previously exposed to staph because staph and atopic dermatitis and eczema are kind of a well-understood correlation, um, potentially causation. So we're still uncovering that. And in the meantime, I've been trying to understand what might drive these staph in the home environmental reservoir. And so I've started to look at whether phthalates in home dust could influence staph aureus or could even influence the entire built environment microbiome of the home. But we've also been able to go back to NHANES and identify the potential for effect modification given exposure to both the phthalates and to staph aureus colonization, although not necessarily in the direction you would expect. It's our non-colonized folks who have worse disease and those who are colonized who appear to have some kind of modulation. But that's a little bit tougher to explore in NHANES. So we have three different, um, in this particular one, looking at asthma attack. If we take a peek at all the different metabolite groups, we have quartile one to quartile four in each of these groupings. We find that MIBP, MBZP, and MMBP are the three where we have significant interaction in this particular outcome. So I'd like to thank all of my collaborators on this, and I want to give a special shout out to Drs. Elizabeth Matsui and Leslie Mkirios Alcala, um, who have been working with me on the asthma outcomes. And if you're still scratching your head, I think I'm allowed to take clarifying questions only at this time, and I hope I've gotten us a little bit back on track for time. Thank you very much. <laughs>